And we're starting a brand new series this weekend called Beast Marks and Blood Moons. When, when you hear the title, Beast Marks and Blood Moons, well, what, what do you think of? Like, do you think of the end of the world? You know, you go like, oh man, the end of the world. Do you start considering like who the Antichrist is? And maybe you have theories who the Antichrist is. Don't point. If your mother-in-law's here, don't point. It's not fun. It's not fun. Just joking, mother-in-laws. Mother-in-laws are great. All mother-in-laws are mothers too, you know, so that's Hey, and maybe it's like, is World War III going to happen soon? I mean, what is up with Russia and Putin and Middle East? And by the way, every middle school boy loves the fact that Russia's president is named Putin. They love it. Every time they say it in class, they're like, Putin. He said Putin. It's awesome. You know that's why he's so mean. He got picked on his whole life. He's named Putin. But he's like, what's going on with this? What's happening with all this stuff? And then on September 28th, you guys have probably been following this, the big blood moon deal. It's a blood moon coming. And what does all of this stuff mean? Well, the book of Revelation brings a lot of thoughts and fears into our lives, a lot of questions into our lives. And, and we love the intrigue and the fear and just kind of over the years I think the church has been a little bit guilty uh, of sort of capitalizing on this fear of the book of Revelation like this sort of like we can't possibly know what's going on but you better be really afraid of it whatever it is and so it's kind of happened that way in fact I remember being in middle school and um, in the church that I grew up in, every year or two or so, on maybe Wednesday nights or Sunday nights, we would have to watch this movie, and maybe some of your churches did this too, that was called A Thief in the Night. It was a poorly made 1970s movie that they forced all of us to watch. And we would watch this movie. In fact, this, there was a song. You guys got that in the back. There's a song that goes to the movie. That kind of, that's not it. That would be... That would have been an awesome song had that been the song for the movie. But there's a song that goes to the movie, kind of illustrates the subtle fear out of the, the book of Revelation that this movie kind of set for all of us little middle schoolers as we could like or as we watch it. So listen to these lyrics and see what do you think. Is it communicating hope? Communicating fear? Longest guitar solo in the history of the world. Was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. Everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we I wish you'd been ready, but you weren't. You got trampled on the floor because you weren't. Children died. Children died. I mean, you want to get fierce, you just go straight for children died. Piece of bread couldn't even buy you a bag of gold. Sun's gone. Now listen, this one, this one, this one will make you shake a little bit. I remember, I remember as a little school boy being afraid watching this. And his wife was sleeping in bed. She turns her head. He's gone. How many of you woke up in the morning and thought, I need to find my wife because she probably would be gone in the rapture. I won't be. One just a few. One man, two men in the field. They just walk and one goes, boom, he's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. I wish we'd all been ready. All right, that's enough. That's enough. I remember sitting and watching this movie and going like, sign me up. Like, what do I need to do to not be walking in a field? I don't even walk in fields. But if I'm walking in a field, I don't want to be left behind. Let's sign me up. If I get married one day, I don't want to lay in bed every night going, I wonder if she's going to disappear. I wonder if she's going to disappear. Some of you ladies lay in bed at night wishing, I wish he would disappear. I wish he'd disappear. It would be awesome. But, but it was fear. Just fear all the time. And, and it's kind of like, why do we crave fear? We, we almost do. When you guys heard we're going to do a, a series on the book of Revelation, it was a part of you just kind of went, oh, can't wait to see what all this means. And I'm afraid. This is just fear. I'm afraid that I'm going to go away one day. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be ready. 
I'm afraid that I'm going to be in some line and all this. I'm just going to think I'm getting bread at the grocery store and they're going to go poof and I'm going to have a 666 on my head. I didn't mean to. Well, how did that happen? I didn't want to take it. You know, we just have all this fear. Fear. Well, why do we crave fear? I think when we crave fear, it shows that we have not cultivated love. Really. I mean, in a relationship, fear. When it's driven by fear of, oh, he might leave me. Or maybe it's a dad that you're afraid of, and so you obey because you're afraid. But it's not love for your dad that you obey. Or you, you kind of do something. Maybe some of you have had a health wake-up call. You know what I'm talking about? Like you had a scare, maybe a heart attack scare, or you, you got some information back on some test results, and it was a scare. So fear drove you to eat better and to exercise and those kind of things. But you don't love exercise. Like, you don't love eating better. Every time you're eating the broccoli, you're like, I would much rather have a Krispy Kreme donut. Like, I would much rather have that, but I am afraid of my, what might happen. And when fear is driven to us to an inanimate object like exercise or like eating well or something like that, that's okay. I mean, sometimes we need to have some healthy fear in our life. But when fear is the only thing that drives us into relationship, then, then it's a problem. And so in, in this, we, we have this fear because we haven't cultivated this love with God that we want to serve him. We want to be ready for when he does come back. We want to be ready for whatever's going to happen in the future. Why? Because we love him, not because we're afraid. But there's something about the book of Revelation that kind of taps into our unhealthy desire to be driven by fear. Even the whole idea of that movie was to kind of get people afraid, that you might be left behind. You might not make it. And so fear would drive you into this relationship. And if fear, whatever drives you into a relationship, will be the very thing that has to keep you in that relationship. Whatever drives you into your relationship with your spouse, if it was purely based on lust and it was purely based on sexual desire, then that'll, that'll be the thing that has to keep you there. And when that's not there, you'll look around and go, who is this person? And why are, why are we together? If you're only driven by the moment and fear to your relationship with God, it's the same way. And so it's fear. The, the other thing is, when we kind of search for certainty, it shows that we have not settled our faith. When we, when we search for this certainty in our life. And so a lot of us, we, we kind of get excited about the book of Revelation because we say, you know what? I want to know when it's going to happen. I want to know how it's going to happen. I want to know all the details. I, I want to kind of figure out all the dates and the times, and I want to be able to explain everything about what it says. And so there's this level of control and certainty that you want in your life. And so you're driven towards, all right, I want to go find out. Maybe Pastor Sean's going to put up a big chart, and he's going to tell us, like, here's your life, and here's this date, and then here's this date right here, and this is when the horses are going to come out of the sky, and this is when the guy's going to disappear in the field. This is when all this is going to happen. And you just want certainty. And why? Because you really haven't settled your faith. Faith is to be able to walk boldly into things when you can't see what's going to happen. F faith is the ability to go, I don't, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm certain in who holds the future. And see, there, there's this certainty that we want to capture when we really want to read the book of Revelation and kind of get this certainty. And in fact, there are many of you who spend a lot of time trying to figure all this out, or at least maybe watching pastors on TV who try to figure it out with charts and graphs because you want to know, when will the end of the world be? And when is this all going to happen? But, but here's the deal that's kind of funny about that. Since the death of Jesus Christ, there have been over 200 uh, infamous, kind of famous claims that someone knew the exact date. And, and I don't mean just somebody who stood on a street corner and claimed, tomorrow is the day, he's coming back tomorrow. I'm talking about people who were able to get uh, others to follow them. Like they were able to get a crowd around them. They were able to kind of get support for their idea in dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of people. 200 claims. Roughly it's been about 2,000 years since Jesus died. That's a claim about every 10 years. About every 10 years, someone gets a significant group of people to follow them and says, it's coming soon. 
this is the exact date. This is when it's going to happen. And they kind of rout the, the crowd up. In fact, here's just a couple notable ones. In 44 AD, hadn't been that long at all, Thaddeus, he took 400 people into the desert because he said the world would end. They went out into the desert and, and died together. And then in 80 AD, Ben Zakiah died at about 80 years old, and he expected that the Messiah would come at his time, that he would return, that Jesus would return at his time. He, he led this movement of people. In the year 234, um, Hippopolitus, Hippopolitus, say it fast, act like you know what you're doing, and people believe you're pronouncing it right, got, he kind of got nerdy. He was the first one that really used math and charts and all these things just to give him a little bit more street cred. And he started putting together all the numbers. And he calculated that um, 5,500 years separated Adam and Christ and that the life of the world was going to be 6,000 years because of the six days of creation. And so he kind of calculated all this stuff and used a bunch of different numbers and things. And he predicted that it would, uh, the world would end around 400, somewhere in the 400 range, somewhere around there. And he pushed for that. And, and then there were lots of other claims between that until we get into the modern era. And, and there, Charles Russell, after being exposed to the teachings of William Miller, the founder of the organization, the Jehovah's Witnesses, in, two, in 1914, Russell predicted the return of Jesus Christ and led a whole movement towards that 1914 return. Since then, the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witness has been a part of predicting uh, the end of the world, an exact date that Jesus would come back in 1918, 1920, 1925, 1941, 1975, 1994 as the end of the world. And so they, they've thrown all these dates out there. And now they simply hold the position that it will be 6,000 years after creation. So they still hold this position of 6,000 years after creation. Now, since the first recorded history that we have, we know of, the, the first recorded history is 3,500 B.C. So, so a lot of scientists try to predict how long the world's been around, and we can argue about that all day long. But we know that we know there's recorded history in about 3,500 B.C. or before Christ. If you kind of add that up, we would assume that that day would be somewhere between now and 2,500. You know, if, the, if it was a little bit older than 3,500, it would be really soon. At the most, it would be 2,500. So I think that they figure now, if we just throw a date out there every now and then, one day we're going to be right. One day you're going to be right. So like someone who's pregnant the other day told me, I really, really think I'm having a boy. And I said, you have a 50-50 chance. 50-50 chance of being right. And, and, you know, when people are right, we're like, they're geniuses. Well, they had a 50-50 chance. That's what, really what happened there. And so there's this, there's this thing going on they're throwing out there. Hal Lindsey, you may have heard that name before, boldly declared that the rapture, and we'll talk about that in a subsequent week, this whole idea of the rapture and what does the Bible say about the rapture and what, what, what do we know about the rapture. But he... He said that the rapture would occur before December 31st of 1981, based on Christian prophecy, astronomy, and a dash of ecological fatalism, meaning that the world was going to come to an end because it was all falling apart. The world was falling apart. And so, so all that was happening. We also have this picture. I love this one. 88 reasons. 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. That was a book. Really good selling book, actually, and uh, until 1989. Then it didn't sell so bad. Didn't sell so bad. And so that was, that was one way. And then, look at this. I love this one. You guys remember all the Mayan stuff a couple, couple years ago? Remember that? I love this. It says, I only had enough room to go up to 2012. This guy says, ha, that'll freak somebody else someday. You guys remember that? The Mayan ca calendar ran out in 2012, and so everybody was like, this is it. It's the end of the world. The Mayans knew something. The Mayans knew it. They knew what was happening. And, and then we got this May 21st. It, it, we, everybody predicted May 21st, 2011. You guys remember that? I mean, big time. Lots of people selling homes and cashing in. And, just, and I'm like, why are you cashing in? I mean, you don't need it. And May 21st, keep your home. I mean, give your home away. Why are you selling your homes? But May 21st, it was going to come, 2011. Everything was going to happen on that day. And, and so the, the point is, is this series is not going to be about telling you when Jesus is going to come back. We're not going to pick a date. We don't have Kool-Aid waiting for you in the foyer at the end of this. All right? So that, that's not how it's going to happen. And what, what is odd about all of those predictions, all 200 plus of them, is that Jesus actually tells us a lot about what will happen 
at the end of the world, and how will he will actually return in, in Matthew chapter 24. It's where you can get most of like what things might look like and kind of put things together. And, and then he ends the discussion, though, like this. He says, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Only the Father knows. It, it's almost humorous. How, how many of kind of the, man, if we could only know, like if we could only know the answer to this, how many of those types of problems in life could be solved if we just simply would look and see what Jesus said about it. So a lot of us, a lot of preachers, a lot of people have spent a lot of time going, man, if we could figure this out. If we can just put all this together, we can figure it out. If we would just read the Bible, Jesus says, no, you can't know. You're never going to know. So as soon as someone says, this is the day that Jesus is coming back, you can go, okay, he hasn't read the Bible. So I'm not, I don't listen to preachers who don't read the Bible, right? So, so that, that's what you can do. You can cancel that out just a little bit. All right, so, so where does this all come from then? Like, what, what does this desire come from? Much of it comes from people's kind of study and really inter attempted interpretation or interpretation, whichever way you want to look at it, of the book of Revelation. And so we have these ideas about the Antichrist and the Battle of Armageddon and the dreaded four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you grew up in the 80s, all you think about when you hear four horsemen is the old WWF wrestlers, the four horsemen. They were awesome, incredible. But the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you don't have to be a student of religion really to recognize these references to the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the, in the Bible, there's just finality to it, and people over the ages have just been fascinated with it for centuries. And, and people who don't even follow religion are, are nonetheless familiar with these figures and, and the images of Revelation. I mean, look at it. Some WWF wrestlers name themselves after figures from the book of Revelation. And, and I know most of you think, well, most of you think about the book of Revelation, too. You don't even attempt to read it. Like, you don't even attempt to look. It's that, you know, there are lots of books in the Bible probably that you haven't actually read. It's the one that you don't, you will even admit you haven't read, right? Like, people are like, have you ever read Habakkuk? And you're like, absolutely. It's a great book. It's a great book. Modern fairy tale. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. It's a great book. And so now, I, I know that, so you, you think it's confusing. Like, you, I don't want to even go after it. Don't want to go after this. But the question is, can we really learn anything from this book of Revelation? And why not be intimidated by this book? I mean, really, when you look at it, no other New Testament book reads like the book of Revelation. It's a completely different type of writing. Um, the book virtually drips with blood and reeks of sulfur, and it kind of has this kind of overlay of a horror movie over it, it seems like. And, and at the center of this final battle between good and evil is this action hero like Jesus. No more meek, no more mild. He's now got a tattoo on his thigh and he's ready to go and kick butt and take names, you know, kind of deal. I mean, he is just really, really the Jesus that we look at and we go, that's our, sh our, our man, Jesus. And so we look at this and it's confusing. And, and so let's just start with learning just a little bit about the book itself. I think it's important as we study this book together in the next few weeks that we really learn it. So look at Revelation 1, 1 through 3, be on the side screens there. It says, starts with the revelation, the revelation. Let's just stop there for just a minute. A revelation is, you, you kind of had it, you're like, man, I had a revelation, you know, today about something. Man, that, there was just a revelation about this. It was just, that is like this, this opening up like this, kind of, I understand a little bit better now. So, so just kind of hold that thought. We start the book by saying it's a revelation from Jesus Christ. So this is from Jesus. This isn't something that John just wrote down. This is from Jesus Christ, which, gave, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. What soon takes place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So this book is written by John. He was the disciple who Jesus loved. It's, he refers to himself as he was close to Jesus. He, he's on the island of Patmos, and uh, he's there as a captive and, and being just kind of held because they can't kill him. They've tried to kill him. He says, they tried to kill me over and over again, but they weren't able to kill me. And so he's there now, and, and he gets this revelation from Jesus 
given by God that, that, that he writes down, who testifies to everything he saw. So this is what John saw. So everything's written down. John saw this. G God gave it to Jesus, who then gives it to John. John saw it. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and listen to this, take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. I love that phrase, take it to heart. Because a lot of times we think the book of Revelation doesn't have anything there for us. It says right here in the beginning, you should read it. You'll be blessed by it if you read it. But there's something to take to heart. There's something to learn from it. There, there's something that, that we can kind of apply in our lives. And so that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. Now, now here's a couple of lessons that I want us to walk away with today. Now, this is the lessons for today that I believe um, are really important as you study any book of the Bible, but they're especially important as we study the book of Revelation together. And we'll kind of grab these in a couple different ways, but I want to give you these lessons up front so you'll know what we're trying to accomplish today. The first lesson is this. When you're reading the Bible, you look for general principles in Scripture rather than making every story about you. Like, like as you read the Bible, there doesn't have to be a, a, an instant turn on how does this, what is God saying to me in this? Yes, it's through a principle, but not my life's going to go exactly like this. So there are principles in the Bible. Now, lesson number two is obey what we do know before we opine on what we don't know. So we're going to read the book of Revelation together. We're going to walk through this book, and we're going to figure out how, what can we obey that we do know, rather than going, all right, let's get our charts and our graphs and our calculators out and figure out what we don't know. So a lot of times we spend a lot of time not obeying what we do know because we're so ca captivated by what we don't know. And, and so when you read the Bible, don't get caught up on, I didn't understand this one little phrase, or I didn't understand this. Work on the things you did grab from it first. And I believe in the book of Revelation that, that we can do that. In fact, look at what Paul said to Timothy about the Bible in whole, as a whole. He says this, all scripture, all scripture, say that back to me on three, one, two, three. All scripture, all scripture which includes the book of Revelation, all scripture is inspired by God, is useful to teach us what is true, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. All scripture is there to teach us what is true and then what is wrong in our lives. It's there to point out truth, what we do know, what we can see, and then for us to obey it, causing a change in our lives that we would be more like Jesus. And then it says it corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So if we look at this book of Revelations through this lens, we should be able to read the book of Revelation, and if all Scripture is inspired by God, then this book was inspired by God. If all Scripture is useful to teach us, then this book can teach us. If all is there to make us realize what is wrong in our lives and to help us correct it, then the book of Revelation has principles in it that can help us correct things in our lives as well. And so it's sort of a demystifying of this book to say, wait a minute, God said that all of Scripture was able to help us. And so over the next four weeks, we're, we're going to be in this series called Beast Marks and Blood Moons to look at the practical, how you can use it in your life right now, uh, book of Revelation. All the practical things about it, the applications in it. So, so let's begin, though, with, with kind of tearing down maybe a few of the myths about the book of Revelation that have caused you not to think that it's applicable, to cause you to think that it's kind of this weird last book that you don't really need to read. It doesn't really shape you into being like Jesus and to seeing it for more of what it is. Here's some myths, four big myths about the book of Revelation. The, the first myth is that Revelation, it, the book of Revelation, is about us. It's about us. You know, we're, we're kind of a meistic society, aren't we? We, we, read, we read and see everything and think it's about us. We read things on Facebook, and we think, well, that was about me. They were, they were posting that about me. We, we read things in the news, and we go, that's going to happen to me. I mean, if, if, if you hear on the news that something's going to happen, you immediately go, it's going to come my way. This is going to happen to me, because we're very meistic. But we've got to remember that the first principle for Bible reading is that it was first for them, 
and then the original kind of the original audience and and we begin there john wrote this book and he said to, he delivered it on a route that would go right leaving Patmos. If you were look at the map, there's this route that you would take if you left Patmos and took this and delivered it to all the churches that were in the route that would, that would kind of be leaving Patmos. There were seven churches. And so he delivered it to that group of people. This was to the seven churches. And we kind of begin there. And, and John wrote this book for a first audience. It was them. And so when we read the book, we got to go, okay, what was happening there? Like, like, let me get some context about what was happening. When we read Paul's letters to the churches that he wrote to, we got to go, what was happening there? Like, what, what was going on that made him write this letter? Well, what was going on that made him kind of give these principles? So there was something going on there. And then so what we need to always look for then, for us, is principles. They're principles. Take, for example, Jeremiah 29.11. If you've been around the church very often, you've probably heard of Jeremiah 29.11. Probably a verse you've heard. It goes like this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. I love this verse. I have preached on this verse. I, I, I kind of live this verse. I believe in this verse for my life. But this verse, however, comes with a first audience and a second audience. The, the first audience is Jeremiah. God was giving a very specific promise to Jeremiah. For him, it was a promise. This is going to happen in your life, Jeremiah. This is how it's going to happen. This is what you have to do. The whole book of Jeremiah explains it even more. And then the second audience is you and I. It's us. We are the second audience. And for us, there is a principle. So God is not making this promise to us. But there's a principle within it that holds a promise. If God had plans for Jeremiah, then I bet he had plans for me. If God wants to see Jeremiah's life prosper and not have calamity come into it, then I bet that he has the same principle for me who he loves. I bet if he had a, a ministry, a plan for Jeremiah, then he's got a ministry plan for me. Like he has plans for my life. And so there's a principle in there. And the book of Revelation is a lot like that. There was a first audience. And really the first audience was John. Jesus is the writer of the book of Revelation, right? He delivers it from God to John. And so this was something that Jesus specifically wanted John to see. He found John on the island of Patmos to give him this revelation. What an incredible thing. John gets to have this. And then something in the way he told him or something prompting led him to go, I need to send this to the other churches. Because I'm sure in their time of hanging out with Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us that there was more than they could have ever written down. Like they, they experienced Jesus in such incredible ways. They saw him do incredible things. And John says, if we tried to write all of that down, it would fill up more books than the world could hold. We just gave you what God inspired us to give you. And so this could have been the same. It could have been something that Jesus gave to John as a gift. But, in, but he prompted him to make it a part of our scriptures. And so he sent it to the churches. The second audience really was the churches. And then we're kind of the third audience even. All right. So John sent this to the churches. Then he sent to us. And so there's these principles. And let me give you a few kind of things to look through that were to the churches, specifically through those seven churches and principles that happened there. To, to the church in Ephesus, in Revelation 2, 1 through 7, he gives him the principle of don't lose your love for God's truth or his people. Incredible principle that we can take as well. To Smyrna, he gives remain faithful in the face of tribulation and in poverty. 2, 8 through 11. And in other words, we read the book of Revelation about all the poverty, and it's not to say that we won't encounter poverty, but there was a specific church who was going to encounter poverty, who was going to encounter tribulation in an amazing way. And, and then the other churches is Revelation 2, 12 through 17, resist Satan's influence. In Revelation 2, 18 through 29, resist false teaching. In Sardis, in Revelation 3, 1 through 6, it says, remain zealous and pure in your conduct. In Revelation 3 to Philadelphia, it says, persevere and walk through the doors God opens for you. And Laodicea, it says, don't become lukewarm about God's way of life. 
Don't, don't be one that, if you've kind of read through this book, you remember it says he, God would spit you out because you're lukewarm. Be hot. Be cold, but don't be lukewarm. There's a, there's a principle, but this is a principle given to the churches. He was teaching the churches through John, through Revelation. And now we read it and go, okay, what can we take it from it? And, and when we don't find the principles, when we don't read the book of the Bible and go, what is the principle for our life? then we will be tempted to look at the Bible as a history book. And this is what happened. I mean, this is, this is things that happened. Or a, a philosophy book. Or even just prophecy. So within the book of Revelation, there is history. It's incredible, deep history. Well, within the book of Revelation, there's practical. There's philosophy. There's principles. Within the book of Revelation, certainly there is prophecy. It says in verse 3 that it is a prophetic book. But our temptation, when we look at it as just prophecy, because we skip the principles. So that's myth number one. It's just about us. That we just need to read it through the lens of about us. We need to think of the whole picture. The, the second myth is what revelation reveals is our future. It's all about our future. Kind of ended on that just now. There's this whole idea of it being a book of just prophecy. Revelation 1.3 says, God blesses the one who reads the words of prophecy to the church. So, I mean, it's certainly a book of prophecy. It, it certainly has a, a lens and a, a view of, a, of how is the world going to come to an end. It, it certainly matches up with Matthew 24. And you go, how do these two things speak together to show us how the world will end? And, but the book is not purely prophecy. In fact, there's a couple different views. Uh, on the book of Revelation. I think it's important that we know these views. I think it's important that we understand that there's more than one view from, from very smart people, very faithful people, on how the book of Revelation reads. And, and the book is seen by some Christians as completely, at, at least starting in chapter 4, completely about the future that has not yet begun. So a lot of scholars, a lot of theologians read this book and go, it's about the future that has not begun from like chapter 4 on. And, and they, they just, if you want to learn kind of the big words and write these down behind, you know, this theology, that would be dispensational premillennialist. Say that out loud seven times. Dispensational premillennialist. And they, they kind of believe that this is a future that hasn't yet begun. And they look at it through the complete lens of prophecy. And I think a little bit what we're missing with that is the practical application that Paul promised Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed for rebuke and for reproof and to help us and we miss that when we look at it that way and then another camp would see the book of revelation as sort of a blueprint of history so sort of all this stuff has already happened these are the historistic view and so it's like this is all about things that have already happened so they're good well-meaning Christians who believe that all of this calamity that, that they were talking about happened in 70 A.D. with the, the, the fall of, of just Jerusalem and, and, and just the temple being broken down. And Jesus had kind of predicted that too was going to happen and, and that John was pointing towards something that hadn't happened yet then but was going to happen then, but was going to happen in the future. And, and so that's another view. It's kind of a, just a blueprint of history. And then there's another camp that sees this as events um, having occurred or some having occurred as well. And they would be the preterist view. And it's sort of a mixture of that last view is history. It's this preterist view. But they're kind of not looking forward as much. And then another camp, um, th though sharing some aspects with all the others, sees Revelation as a retelling, so a retelling of sort of this cosmic narrative about judgment, Satan, and the, the final victory of Jesus from multiple different views. So much like the book of Genesis tells the creation story from a, a couple of different views. The, the book of Revelation kind of tells from several different views how all of this is going to come together. And to, to show my cards, just so you'll know, I don't not necessarily know that any of these capture perfect truth, but I find the, most, the, the last one most persuasive. That, that John was given this incredible vision. It's incredible. And some of it was, was history of things that had happened in the book of Daniel had predicted, and it was just incredible stuff. Some of it was future then, but now it's already happened, and he was warning the seven churches about things that were coming in 70 AD. And some of it is things that haven't happened yet. 
And so there's several different views and all coming together. And when you take it and put it with Matthew 24, that you can kind of start to see that something's going to happen. We don't know exactly what, but how does it change our lives? And so then I think that we have to turn our attention to then, how do we study the book of Revelation for it to change us? Change us. And so another myth, that would be the amillennialist, amillennialist view, by the way. Just sort of this view of the millennial is, is sort of kind of different than the post or pre and all that kind of stuff. Those aren't important things. They're just things that maybe some of you would want to know. Uh, the third myth is Revelation, this is a myth, is written in mysterious code. It's just mysterious. I mean, you've you got to get your algebra kind of beefed up. You've got to get your charts and your graphs out. You've got to put letters and numbers together. We love it. There's some guy out there now who, who's written a book on how to manage your money by this mysterious code and revelation. I mean, that'll sell books. But it ain't true. All right? I mean, this is not true. Like, look, if you take, I love it when they're like, do you notice that every seventh letter is an E? And so if you add up all the E's, all the seven letters are E's, and you add these, but it wasn't written in English. So now, the seven letters are E's now, but if you go back to what it was originally written in, it wasn't even E's. Like, so it doesn't add up. It doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work. So, so it's a mysterious code. It's all code. The problem with this, this whole deal, is that John calls the book, and he says early on, that it's a revelation. It's an that, that word means an unveiling. The, the word apocalypse. Apocalypse, we're like, ooh, apocalypse, because all the horror movies have made us fear the word apocalypse. Apocalypse means an unveiling. It, it means a reveal, a revelation, a revealing of the truth. In other words, it means the truth can now be known, not... Now I'll muddle everything up with codes and clever symbols and craziness that you'll never understand. That's not what it means. So, so there's this hope in the very name of the book of Revelation that this book was meant to be understood. And, and there are principles that we can find in the book. And so over the next four weeks, here's what I want us to do as a church. First of all, I'd love us to read the book of Revelation together. There's no way we'll cover every single verse in these four weeks together. So we're going to read it together. I'm going to be on the city, and I'm going to just kind of be commenting a little bit about what I read that day. And we'll give you a little bit of a reading plan every day and just say, hey, read this with us today. Let's just kind of read through it. We're going to break it up in a way that we'll finish it through the course of the series. We'll give you some feedback. I'd love to hear y'all's feedback. And there, there's some of you in here who love to study and do different things so you can look at different views. Just remember what we said earlier. There's lots of different views, lots of different things, but just kind of study through it. But most of all, I would love you just to read the Scripture. Just read the Scripture and say, what does this say? Like, what does this actually say? What is this, what's actually going on here? And so we're going to do that together, and we're just going to take some time to kind of read through it and find what can we learn in the book of Revelation. We're, we're going to look at next week, just to give you some heads up, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. What is the book of Revelation in the Bible in whole? What does it say about the rapture? What does it say about the second coming of Jesus? And how does that affect my life? In two weeks, we're going to look at the mark of the beast. You guys ready for that one? That's going to be fun. We're going to look at it. It says it's in the Bible. It talks about a mark of the beast. So what is that? What, who's the beast? What's the mark? Well, how do we get it? How do we not get it? We're going to answer all those questions on that week. And then in week four, we're going to look at heaven and hell. Is heaven real? What does the book of Revelation say about heaven? Is hell real? What does the book of Revelation say about that? And then we're going to kind of take all of this and we're going to put it in this, this, this package to say, how does it affect my life? How can I take this book and go, hey, you know what? It should, it should teach me. It should encourage me. It should help me to be more like Jesus. It should point out wrong in my life. How can we do that? And we'll study that together. Everybody on board for that? You guys on board for that? Are you, are you disappointed that I don't have a big 90-foot chart up here where I'm going to show you 88 reasons only? Oh, we can't do 88 anymore, right? 2015 reasons why Jesus is going to come back in 2015. That's our sermon series starting next week. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to go 
What, is, what does God want to teach us? So I hope you're behind that. I hope you're with us. Get on the city. If you're not already on the city, do that. And, and we're going we're gonna to really look at this book together. Let's pray. God, thank you for um, just helping us to learn more about you. God, thank you for the fact that you are a God of clarity, not a God of confusion. That God, you're a God who gives hope and faith, not fear. So God, help us to be able to read this book that you've given us and that you chose to include in your scripture and you inspired John with this incredible vision. Help us to bring clarity to it. Help it to strengthen our faith, God. And so God, we pray now that you would move in us and allow us to see places in our lives over the next four weeks together where, God, you, you can teach us. You can correct behavior. and You can make us more like you, Jesus. And God, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.